Hey there guys, to start I know this video is quite long but it contains some really good examples of surface events and teeny tiny microquakes and how they propagate away from their source. Please utilize the parts section in the description box below. My name is Ben Ferriolo and I am dedicated to the responsible and accurate monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. First off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. It is under my email address in the description box below. It can help you learn where and how to find seismic data, how to analyze it, how to understand reading the different plots and charts, and even contains a crazy amount of seismic plots and images pertaining to many, many different seismic events and swarms. Although I monitor tectonic activity, my main focus is volcanic. However, you may already know this if you are watching this video on my website. This video is going to be about info and misconceptions about the UNAVCO borehole seismographs and seismic wave propagation. First off, I must say many of the things that I used to think were true about seismology and seismic instruments ultimately turned out to be completely wrong. Now, of course, I am not perfect and I can be wrong about things and will certainly be wrong about something again. But in regards to the topic of this video, I know this is true through research and even better through personal experience of analyzing data for hours each day. Not trying to sound arrogant or egotistical since I despise those characteristics of a person, but I just want you to know that I have learned this stuff by trial and error and by personal experience and professional publications. First off, do not take my word for it. Do not take the professional's word for it and do not take any YouTuber's word for it. Seriously, just download the data yourself and analyze this stuff yourself. Trust me, trial and error along with personal experience is the best teacher. Let's just say this first. Think of it real hard. Does it really matter if boreholes can detect surface activity or not? Does it make Yellowstone any safer or not a threat if surface noise can be detected on those specific seismic instruments? Of course not. Yellowstone is still a threat. Just know, however, that boreholes do minimize surface noise greatly, depending on their depth and proximity to the normal sources of surface noise, but does it completely eliminate surface noise or surface events 100% no matter what? No, it doesn't. It is still possible, however not as possible as surface instruments. Now, it doesn't matter one bit if boreholes can detect surface activity or not, but it is good to learn about this stuff. The only way it would matter is for two reasons. If number one, we were specifically trying to detect surface activity, and number two, if any type of volcanic eruption would show precursor events that only appear on one station within a dense network, which doesn't happen. Remember, volcanic eruptions are always preceded by a destabilization of the magma chamber due to many types of processes that are taking place. Almost always, there is an intrusion of magma prior to an eruption, and the time from the start of the intrusion to the start of the eruption can vary greatly. However, one thing remains that I wish everyone would think long and hard about. Magma intrusion always causes an earthquake swarm. Because the magma cannot freely move, obviously otherwise it would already have reached the surface, and it is extremely hot and violent, it must intrude and rise through dense rock and possibly pre-existing fractures and tubes. Even if the magma has little resistance ahead of it, it still will chip away at the rock surrounding it, causing high-frequency earthquakes, low-frequency earthquakes and tremor, and even hybrid earthquakes. Now remember, seismic waves propagate away from the source like so, just like a ripple in a pond. Even tremor acts this way. And this isn't just for tectonic activity, guys, or just earthquakes. This goes for anything occurring underground. Basically, any type of event that occurs underground, especially at depths deeper than a thousand feet or more, which is still quite shallow to begin with, will show up on many surrounding stations depending on a multitude of factors, including the depth of the event, the strength of the event, and the density of the seismic network. Starting to make sense? I know it can all be a little confusing at first, but this stuff really is quite easy to understand. Well, once you understand it. <laughs> also, Know that it is entirely possible for real events to be detected on one station. For example, the strong steamboat geyser eruptions used to show on only two stations during the strongest eruptions, YNM and YNR. But as the eruptions started to, to decrease in amplitude, excuse me, it is now only picked up on seismic station YNM. Another example of real seismic events only showing on one station is obviously if it occurs where there are barely any instruments. But another example is some of the very teeny tiny microquakes that occur at Yellowstone that are far too small to be accurately located and are likely to be negative magnitude earthquakes. 
This can be seen during many of the rapid fire swarms where the closest station to the swarm detects events around say 50 to 100 amplitude count that only shows on that one close station. Those events are almost always negative magnitude earthquakes, possibly around negative 0.1 to negative 0.7. But even those real seismic events can be easily distinguished from surface activity. But again, this illustration here and everyday experience in analyzing seismic data will prove to you that any seismic event underground that could be a warning sign for an eruption will appear on multiple stations within a dense network. Magnitudes will not be negative if there is intrusion, guys. So in a network as dense as Yellowstones or Long Valleys, any concerning activity will for sure be picked up on at least a few neighboring stations. So for those asking yourself, what are boreholes? I'm going to tell you now. Here we are at unavco.org under instrumentation and geophysical instruments, which shows all of the instruments that UNAVCO uses. All of them, guys. Let's go down. So, any borehole is just really a deep hole dug by a machine. However, borehole instruments are instruments which are placed at the bottom of the borehole. Borehole seismic instruments are like any other seismic instrument. The only difference is they are surrounded by a substance, usually concrete, plastic, or metal tubing, and are set at the bottom of the borehole, obviously surrounded by dense earth and rock. Instruments by UNAVCO are placed in boreholes anywhere from 100 meters to 200 meters, as stated right here, which would be anywhere from 328 feet to 656 feet. Some instruments are more shallow than others, but tend to stay within that range. One of the reasons of placing a seismometer at the bottom of a borehole is to minimize surface interference. Yes, guys, it does minimize surface events greatly. Wind and many type of weak to mid-range surface activity will not show on borehole instruments. But I have to say, there are a few exceptions which you will see proof for in just a second. Also, microseisms tend to be stronger at those depths, so scientists also use the borehole seismometers to track microseism episodes. Now, there are many vibrations on the surface that can penetrate the ground, such as, let's say, a large convoy of big rigs, a quarry blast, a large drill, and maybe some other events too. Just know that it all depends on a multitude of factors as well, including the strength of the surface noise, the depth of the borehole, and the sensitivity of the instrument. However, I must say again that it does not matter much, since we are already armed with the fact that any seismic event underground will most certainly propagate away like a ripple in a pond. Then the supposed seismic event should show on surrounding stations, right? Well, I'm about to get into that in just a second and show some proof. However, right now I am on the UNAVCO page for every single instrument run by them. Note that we have a slew of instruments. Look at this. GPS receivers, geodetic imaging, SAR satellites, terrestrial laser scanners, laser strain meters which measure deformation on the Earth's surface, borehole instrumentation is grouted in place 100 to 200 meters below the surface at low noise levels, borehole strain meters measure after processing crustal deformation, guys borehole strain meters, again crustal deformation, that is what it records. Seismometers, obviously, to detect seismic waves at periods of several minutes or less, just like any other seismic station. Pore pressure sensors designed to measure fluctuations in groundwater pressure to help characterize the hydrological, excuse me, hydrological response of sites at timescales of seconds to years, so we really wouldn't use that much. Borehole tilt meters to measure tilt from crustal deformation due to deep earth processes such as volcanism and water table recharge discharge over periods of seconds to weeks. And then they have meteorological systems and tide gauge systems. So those are all the instruments that they host. Also, please note UNAVCO does not host any instruments whatsoever that can detect any type of degassing at Yellowstone. If you heard that they do, that person was lying. There are gas instruments at Yellowstone, and any volcanologist would know to monitor the volcano for gas emissions. So if all of these instruments here clearly show they do not record gas, then who does? I have no clue. And I hope to find out someday. But the strain meters, the ones that contain the UNAVCO spectrograms, hold four channels. That is what CH means. But it doesn't matter much since the spectrograms clearly state frequency MHZ on the left. 500 MHZ, note the small m, which is the maximum for the spectrogram, says 500 millihertz, which is still 0.5 hertz. You cannot argue with chart labels, guys. <laughs> Here's the plate boundary network right here. 
Okay, so, and this is what they place it in, the strain meter. They, we're talking about strain meters right now, guys. Borehole strain meters measure very small changes in the dimension of a borehole at depths ranging from 100 to 250 meters. This is accomplished by measuring the change in diameter or volume of a strain meter installed in the borehole. Guys, it, again, it does not record gas. The Plate Boundary Observatory uses an instrument developed and constructed by GTSM Technologies, which measures the change in borehole diameter along three azimuths, separated by 120 degrees perpendicular to the borehole. Strain meters can detect changes in the diameter of a borehole on the order of four picometers, about one ten millionth of the width of a human hair, and smaller than the width of a hydrogen atom! Ho <laughs> ho A change of four pic picometers along the 10 centimeters width of the strain meters equates to approximately 0.05 nano strain while signals of geophysical interest range from several nano strain, nano strain to many hundreds of nano strain for example the strains induced by earth tides the effect of the sun and moon on the earth's crust are tens of nano strain yes with strain meters, you can detect the effect of the sun and the moon on the Earth's crust. Isn't that nuts? It is that sensitive. The Gladwin tensor strain meters have a precision of one part per billion over short periods. The GTSM uses differential capacitive plate transducers to measure change in the borehole diameter. As the borehole deforms, the plates move relative to each other, causing a change in capacitance proportional to the change in distance. The GTSM has three strain gauges oriented 120 degrees apart. The independent measurements of change in length along each axis can be combined to obtain three other strain components that describe the horizontal strain tensor, the aerial strain, and gamma 1 and gamma 2 shear strains. Each gauge is contained in a separate module about 10 centimeters in diameter, and the three modules are stacked above each other within the strain meter. The entire instrument is about 254 centimeters long and weighs about 50 kilograms. The instrument is grouted into the borehole using an expanse of grout. Typical installation starts with a borehole, blah, 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 blah. In total, the borehole network contains nearly 300 instruments and produces close to 1,800 channels of data. Wow. Here we are at borehole seismometers. Here's the microchip that detects vibrations. Yeah, guys, technology is getting very small. UNAVCO installed and maintains more than 70 borehole seismometers as the PBO Borehole Seismic Network with sites located from Vancouver Island to Southern California, including Yellowstone. Most borehole seismometer installations in this network are co-located with borehole strain meters, but a few are standalone. The sensors are Sonde 2 seismometers, so like pretty much any type of seismometer, guys. This sensor uses three 2 Hz geophones in a triaxial configuration. Eight sites in Anza, California reason, region also utilize a type of microelectromechanical systems, MES, MEMS, excuse me, accelerometer. Again, three in a triaxial configuration. Guys, I think an accelerometer is a strong motion station, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. A borehole seismometer unit installed at a proper depth allows for the detection and location of microseisms that can be missed by a surface seismometer. The data set generated by the PBO Borehole Seismic Network has become an integral component to research done in Anza, California and Yellowstone National Park. So we just learned about their instruments and how they minimize surface activity. But does it completely remove the possibility? Let's see. Next, I'm going to show you an example. For this, I needed a specific range of magnitudes, a specific range of depths, and a specific location between seismic stations. It was not easy, but I believe I have found a good example. These coming examples are not surface noise, but are two reported 0.1 earthquakes almost directly between borehole 208 and 944. Remember, depending on the depth, it takes anywhere from 2 to 6 seconds for a seismic wave to travel from stations within many kilometers of each other possibly even seven seconds, depending on the event and the distance to the stations. Okay, so notice how the first event we will analyze is this magnitude 0.1 at 2.0 kilometers in depth on June 6, 2010 at 2245 UTC, which is located right here, right at the tip of my mouse, right there. And then after that, we have one that is exactly the, the same strength, excuse me, almost in the same exact location. Notice that it is a little bit farther down here, but we'll, we'll pretty much get the same idea. So it's a little, pretty much close to the same location, but it's the same size as well, 
but it is twice the depth, occurring at 4.2 kilometers in depth instead of 2.0 kilometers. So we're going to get a pretty good look at how the seismic waves arrive. And please keep in mind the arrivals and the strengths as we go through these events. Afterwards, I will show perfect examples of surface noise, or better stated as a surface event, on a borehole. Here we are in the seismic program swarm. I have opened the data streams to borehole 208 and borehole 944 for the same exact time and the same exact date, showing the first magnitude 0.1 at 2.0 kilometers in depth. We're going to see how it showed up on both stations. And remember, it did occur a little bit closer to borehole 944 than it did on uh, borehole 208. But again, we see 2010. June 7th. June 7th down here, so this is June 6th up here. So that is the same date as the 0.1 that I showed before. So let's scroll back and let's turn Persistor Rescale off. Now I have opened Borehole 208 as well. We are going to turn Persistor Rescale off. Then we're going to go up to the date again, 2010, 6, 0, 7. So that's June 7th, 2010. Down here it is June 7th, so this is the same exact time frame as the other uh, chart right back here. Let's go backwards. Okay, so what time did this occur at? 2245. 2245. 2245. Where are you? Where is 2245? Here it is right here. 2245. Second mark is 26. So it took about four seconds to reach this station, which is normal. Okay, so here's the magnitude 0.1. Notice amplitudes barely go beyond 400, but there is only one tiny spike that goes all the way to about 550. So let's just say 550 on borehole 944 for the magnitude 0.1 at 2.0 kilometers in depth, arrived at about 2245.29. But again, you can see the magnitude 0.1, which contains very little energy, guys. I'm talking very, very little energy. And again, it was at 2.0 kilometers in depth, so it is pretty shallow, actually. And you can see it right there, again, going to about 550 amplitude count. Now let's look at borehole 208, which is on the opposite side of Yellowstone Lake on the northern tip. Let's see if we see it. 2245.30, here it is right here. Looky, looky, we see it right here. A little bit of background micro -seisms. So let's turn on a little bit of a filter, shall we? But again... We do see it right there. Here's the spectrogram of it. Again, it looks weak because it is only a 0.1 earthquake, which is very weak. Shows up at about 2245.29. So it showed up almost at the same time as it did on borehole 944. But again, this is just proof, just to show you how even the smallest seismic events, even the most shallow, teeny, tiny events still propagate away and show on distant stations. Yeah. But on the helicorder, notice how you can barely see it on the helicorder? That's why you got to use seismic analysis programs, guys. But good thing, they are very easy to use. Again, I just want to look at it one more time. Here's the 0 0.1 at 2.0 kilometers in depth in 2010. It showed on borehole 208, going to about 212 amplitude count. And then we have this one going to about 550. Okay, so we just saw that the 0 0.1 at 2.0 kilometers in depth did show on borehole 944 and borehole 208, which are actually a good distance away from each other. So now we can actually see that the seismic waves did propagate away from the source like they should. So again, here we see the energy from the magnitude 0.1 lost a little more than half of its strength when reaching borehole 208. Borehole 944 showed around 558 amplitude count or so, and borehole 208 showed around 212 amplitude count. This event did occur slightly closer to B944, but now we see how the event traveled to each station from its source. Even an, again, even a very shallow, extremely tiny, weak earthquake can still appear on these distant stations. And if you are wondering, here are the seismic stations that I will be using for the data in this video. We have YLT, which is right here near the northern tip of West Thumb Lake, kind of the northwestern tip, kind of. And then we have borehole 944, which is down here, which is what we just looked at. And then borehole 208, which is way up here. See, on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. Then we have YLA, which is right here. And then we have YTP, which is right down here. So having these stations forms almost a nice circle around Yellowstone Lake, giving us a good look at how the seismic waves propagate away from the source. We already know the teeniest, tiniest, most shallow events still show on surrounding stations. So... 
Why are there some events that appear on Bullhorn 944 that don't show on any surrounding stations at all? How is that possible when sometimes their amplitudes carry amplitudes stronger than the 0.1 I just showed? Wouldn't that suggest that surface events are still possible on boreholes? Well, we'll check it out in just a second. Okay, so we just looked at the 0.1 and 2.0 kilometers in depth, which occurred right here, right there. Next, we're going to look at the 0.1, which occurred at 4.2 kilometers in depth, which is right about here. Yes, it is a little bit more to the southeast, but we still will get a good look on how the seismic waves propagated away from the source. Here we are in the seismic program swarm. I have borehole 208 and borehole 944 added as well, once again. Notice, uh, let's see, the 0 0.1 at 4.2 kilometers in depth occurred on February 16th. 2011 and we have 216 let's see the year 2011 so this is the exact same day let's open borehole 944 let's see 2011 217 the 17th down here so this is the same exact day for both data streams persistent rescale off 95 overlap for spectrogram and let's do persistent rescale off overlap 95 for borehole 208 once again so let's pan up here and let me zoom in Okay, so 0 0.1 at 4.2 kilometers in depth at 0 0.30, which is right here. Let me make sure. Let's see, 4.2 kilometers in depth, 0 0.30, 0 0.1 on the 16th, 2011. And that is what we have right here. Okay, so let's first look at it on borehole 944. Here it is right here. Going up to about 300 amplitude count. Again, this is borehole 944 we are looking at right now. You can see it started at about 30.05. So 0, 0, 0030 UTC at the 5 second mark, which means it took about 3 to 4 seconds to reach this station from its uh, actual occurrence. But we again, we do see it going up to 300 amplitude count. Remember the amplitude counts on the left. That is very important and one of the aspects that if you don't understand, then it's going to be hard to understand this video. This just means strength, guys. This just means strength. Okay, now let's go to borehole 208 and see how strong it was here. Notice how the amplitudes are actually a little bit stronger on borehole 208, but that's not what I want to focus on. Let's look at the arrival time just real quick. Started right about here. 30.06, so it's showing a little bit stronger, but it took about an extra second to reach borehole 208. But the thing is, I still want you to understand this, that an earthquake carrying around 400, about 200 to 400 amplitude count, you know, uh, shown on the boreholes, it, it's always going to show on surrounding stations, guys. And this is a magnitude 0 0.1. I mean, obviously, you can get a little smaller than a 0 0.1, as you will see in just a second. But these are some of the smallest earthquakes you can ever, ever see reported, actually. Some of the smallest ones ever. And they still are sometimes smaller in amplitude count than the surface noise, or what I believe to be surface noise, as you will see in just a second. But again, 400 amplitude count, borehole 208, 300 right here. And you can tell it's a real seismic event. All right. So we saw this magnitude 0.1, which was twice as deep as the first 0.1 I showed, still lost about half of its power when reaching borehole 944 from borehole 208. But the earthquake did occur pretty much right in between the stations, actually. Remember, careful when you are comparing amplitude counts from the PB network to the stations in the WY network. For example, stations in the WY network, such as YLT, YLA, YTP, record events stronger, at least in regards to amplitude counts, than the stations in the PB network, such as B208, B944, etc. However, if an event goes beyond 32,000 amplitude count in the WY network, it cuts off, whereas the amplitude count on boreholes can go well beyond that. See, this stuff is mainly stuff that you learn while you analyze events every single day with personal experience. For example, I have YLT opened right here. Notice 2011, 217. The 17th's at the bottom. So if we go back, it is the 16th. Let's go right here. Yep, see, 216, February 16, 2011, which means it's the same day, same data stream, but from a different station. Again, we have YLA, 2011, 216. Again, same day as borehole 208 and B944 that I just showed. And you will notice 
Even on YLA, which is farther away from the epicenter, it does show this event. But look, going up to 3,000 amplitude count, even the closer station, even though the closer stations in the PB network, the boreholes, detected it only going to what 400 amplitude count. How is that possible? Well, it's because the uh, stations of the WY network do record events stronger, ex unless they go beyond 32,000 amplitude count. If they go beyond 32,000 32, amplitude count, excuse me, then it'll be cut right at the top. But the boreholes do not do that. So it's kind of a give or take situation. Again, here is YLT. You can even see the event here on YLT. Very interesting, guys. So again, it propagated away from the source very far, and it was only a magnitude 0.1. And it traveled miles and miles in seconds, guys. In seconds. I'm going to say 6 to 7 seconds to reach YLT. So yeah, that's pretty much how seismic events work. Again, you could clearly see the events shown on YLA and YLT, which are a great distance away from the epicenters, but somewhat equidistant. But here we see higher amplitude counts, going off topic, but again, you could tell the seismic events propagated away from the source like a ripple in a pond. So unless the activity is right at the surface and carries extremely teeny tiny weak energy, say around negative 0.5 to negative 0.7 or so, the activity will show on many stations if it is deeper and stronger. But the thing is, is even the tiniest, tiniest, weakest, weakest, even some negative magnitude earthquakes still show on many surrounding stations. Of course, any precursor activity pointing even towards a tiny eruption at Yellowstone would show on many stations, even if the precursor activity stayed around magnitude 1.5 to 2.0, which I believe it would be more around 2.5 to 3.0, but that's just, that's for a different video. So again, what is the point of believing boreholes can or cannot detect surface activity? So now let's check out some surface noise. Remember, even a tiny earthquake of magnitude 0.1 showed quite well on borehole 944, borehole 208, YLT, and YLA. And those were only the stations that I showed, and those events had about the same energy as a big rig passing by. But please note that was not a completely accurate description. It could have been a little bit more energy or a little bit less, but I'm just saying it's not much energy, guys, from a 0.1. Notice how events travel greater through the earth than on the surface. People tend to think things travel better on the surface and in the air, and that the earth and rock can block it. That is not true, guys. Even concrete, even metal, you, you can't stop seismic waves no matter where they are coming from. Seismic waves actually travel better and faster through the earth than they do on the surface. How else can you explain how P and S waves, which only travel through the earth, travel faster and more efficiently than surface waves such as Love or Rayleigh waves? For an example of wave propagation, go to this site here, isc.ac.uk slash standard slash phases. I will leave a link to this in the description box below to this website. It shows how the many different P and S waves travel differently through the earth and what they and how they react. Guys, trust me, this will teach you a lot about seismic wave propagation and how they actually travel better through denser rock and other stuff like that. So it's, they can even go to the core, guys. You know, things can actually penetrate our core, our outer core and seismic waves can pass right through it. And the core is pretty dang dense, guys. But the mantle and core sections on this page are mainly more for earthquakes that are much deeper. Just keep this page in mind and also search Google for PNS waves compared to Love or Rayleigh waves which are surface waves. And as one last example of how a, si a teeny, teeny, tiny seismic event can travel, let's la take a look at how the waves from this magnitude negative 0.1 earthquake at 3.6 kilometers in depth traveled. These types of earthquakes, which I like to call microminis, are some of the smallest earthquake events that can ever occur. So why don't we see how it arrived on station Borehole 944, Borehole 208, and YLA. Having those three stations actually forms a type of triangle with the negative 0.1 in the middle, so we should get a pretty good look. So here we are back in the seismic program swarm. What I'm about to show you guys, I really hope you pay attention very closely because this will prove to you that surface events on a borehole are possible. It's it's very rare. I mean, it's not very rare. It can happen here and there. But boreholes minimize surface events greatly, guys. They minimize them greatly. But as you're about to see, it is still possible. So first, we're going to look. So 602-2011 at 10.50 UTC. So June 2nd, we have June 3rd, which is at the bottom. So June 2nd, 2011. 
So let's go back. Turn persistent rescale off. Set overlap to actually I'm not even going to do the overlap for the spectrogram right now since I'm not even using any spectrograms. So let's just go back. Let me show you June 2nd, 2011. And what is this? Wow, that looks like some type of surface noise possibly, but we will get into that in just a second. And look, all of these cannot be seismic events, guys. They cannot because not all of them show up on surrounding stations. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just first take a look at the negative magnitude earthquake and how it propagated away from the source. Persistent rescale off. So, and YLA I have as well. Again, June 2nd, 2011. All three stations have the same data streams, but they're different stations, obviously. What was it? 1050. Let's see. Let's go back. It occurred at 1050.30. So let me just zoom in just real quick. Okay, again, still we have June 2nd, 2011 at about 1050. So I'm going to say right about, what's that right here? Aha, here it is right here. 1050.30. 105030. Okay, so this is the negative 0.1 magnitude earthquake. Very tiny, but still on in the WY network on YLA it does show 1500 amplitude count. And this is a negative magnitude earthquake, guys. But I really don't want to focus on YLA right now. Uh let's put this to the side. Let's go to borehole 944 and look at 1050. 105030. Here it is right here. Notice going up to about, I'm going to say, 150 amplitude count. So this negative 0.1 earthquake at 3.6 kilometers in depth was detected on borehole 944 going to about 150 amplitude count. Notice that. Okay, remember that. Please keep that in mind. 150 amplitude count on B944 and then on borehole 208. We see 105030, yep, we see about 400 amplitude count, but still, it still showed, right? It was extremely weak, extremely, extremely weak, but guess what? It still showed. Okay, let me show you something real quick. I'm going to zoom out twice, zoom out twice. Okay, so down here we have something interesting I would like you to take a look at. Right here. Do you see this event? Now I'm going to go up. This is borehole 944. This is a borehole which supposedly doesn't detect any surface activity at all. Well, it does minimize surface events greatly, but it's still possible, guys. It's still possible. Check this out. Whoops. Check this out. Okay, borehole 944 going down. Here is the supposed seismic event. Notice how it goes up to about 600 amplitude count, right? You notice that? So right here, 600 amplitude count is stronger than what the negative 0.1 was, right? So the negative 0.1 carried much weaker strengths than this event down here, right? I'm going to say it again. This event is stronger on borehole 944 than the negative 0.1 earthquake. So if that's true, and if this is a real seismic event and surface noise cannot be detected on a borehole, then how can we go to borehole 208? Let's see, 1842 exactly is right when it peaked. Let's go to 1842, and here we are on borehole 208 in the PB network, just on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, which also detected the negative 0.1. So if that possible surface event on borehole 944 was real and occurring underground, we should see it on borehole 208, right? Again, peaked at about 1842.00. Let's go to 1842.00. 1842.00. And this is the same time frame. Notice the bar I have right down here, the analysis bar. It is the same time frame. So let's try to match it up perfectly, shall we? Let's start at 18. Let's see. Let's put 1842 right in the middle. So it should look somewhat like this, right? It could look a little weaker, but it's still, if this is not a surface event, it has to show on borehole 208 if that negative magnitude earthquake did as well, right? It has to. But let's put 1842 right in the middle. 1842, I'm not seeing anything at all. Where is it? Where is it, guys? It is not showing any of the same type of activity whatsoever at all. Let's go to the spectrogram real quick. Nope, not seeing it. Let's go to the spectrogram borehole 944. Look at those waves. I don't know what the heck this was. It's a very weird event, that's for sure. But it's stronger, guys. It's stronger than the negative 0.1, but it doesn't show on any surrounding stations. But this negative 0.1 did. 
doesn't this prove that surface events are still possible on boreholes? But then again, it really, in the end, it does not matter at all since we're already armed with the fact that any concerning seismic event, even ones that aren't concerning, would still propagate away from the source like a ripple in a pond. But just to make sure, let's go to YLA just real quick. Here we are, YLA. We just looked at borehole 208 and borehole 944. But again, here is YLA. Let's, okay, we persist to rescale off. Zoom out twice. So let's go to 1842 and keep it right in the middle, right? 1842. So it at least should show on this station, right? There's something right there, but that is far before, far before. Remember, it peaked right here and started right around here. I'm not seeing anything, guys. Nothing. Let's look at the spectrogram and see if we see anything. Nope. Nope. Okay. Borehole 944. This is the surface event. Borehole 208 is not showing anything, and neither is YLA. So how is that possible if boreholes do not show surface events at all? How is that possible, guys? See, these are the types of events that I run into all the time. I have to say, though, borehole 208, 206, 950, 207, and other boreholes in the United States are really good at keeping surface events to a minimum. However, borehole 944 does see a lot more than it should. I don't know, maybe it's too shallow or something. I don't know. I don't know why, guys, but it is true. I mean, this is what I run across every single day, and I compare it on surrounding stations, and there's nothing there. So obviously, this cannot be seismic in nature. Because even a shallow, negative 0.1 earthquake, which carries less energy than this, even that showed on stations many miles away within a few seconds. 18, let's put 1842 right in the middle, right there. Again, waveforms, nothing. We should see it at least a little bit, right? It's up to 600 amplitude count, which means we should see it at about 150 to 250 amplitude count on borehole 208. But we're here on B944, and there it is right there. Nothing. Nothing on borehole 208. And also nothing on seismic station YLA. So right there, we just saw proof that surface events are still possible on a borehole. They are minimized greatly, but they are still possible. Now, please, guys, I am begging you, do not take my word for it. I am literally telling you right now, do not trust me. Do not trust me that I am telling the truth right now. Go and take the data streams from any select day that looks like it has surface events on Borehole 944. You can use isthisthingon.org in the calendar section to look through the... Uh, the seismic charts in more of a broad view because it does take kind of a lot of time to download a year's worth of data. It takes a long time to do that. But is this thing on.org slash Yellowstone does have uh, an archive there, which actually helps you go through and just see, okay, what swarms occurred here, what events occurred here. Just go to borehole 944 and look at some of the events that I showed that look like surface events. Then download the data from that station and many surrounding stations and compare it. It may sound hard, but it's actually very, 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 very easy to do, guys. Very easy. only takes me a few minutes to do it. So, and my website helps teach you how to do that, but still. Okay, so here we are in the seismic program waves. I actually wanted to do a different example for this. Since I already showed one example in Swarm, I didn't want to just rest with one example of a surface event on a borehole. But in the seismic program waves, I've opened up the data stream for January 22nd, 2019. Over here, we see some possible surface events right here. But if they're not, who knows? But then how come they don't show on the surrounding stations then? Let's zoom in. We have possibly one emergent event right here. Doesn't really look like much. That really wouldn't show on surrounding stations either. Something happened here, but it is not connected to this since the arrival times are off. We would have to see it start right about there, right? And we don't. So these two could be showing the same thing, but are separate from borehole 944. But let's go forward, shall we? Let's go to a stronger one. Let's see. Now remember, the negative 0.1 earthquake at 3.6 kilometers in depth traveled to all the stations around Yellowstone Lake, guys. All of them detected the negative 0.1. But this, look at this, right here, 106 amplitude count, should show at least a little bit on borehole 208. Let's expand it. Does it show it at all up here? No, I don't see it at all. Now, I already proved that surface events are possible in a borehole using seismic program swarm. You obviously saw how that worked out. And it looks like we do have some earthquakes up near borehole 208. But I don't know if those are earthquakes or not. I don't know what those are. Those are very odd. And these, even these on borehole 208 are going to 283 amplitude count, which means we should see at least a little bit on surrounding stations, but we don't. 
And then we have another emergent event right there. They weren't that strong on this day. Then we have an earthquake. See, here's an earthquake that appeared. Actually, never mind. That's way too long of arrival time. It should have showed right here. See this earthquake? If that was a real seismic event, guys, it should have shown within a few seconds. I mean, this is 1743 at the 10 second mark. This is 1744 at the 46 mark. That doesn't make any sense. That's longer than a minute, guys. We already saw that seismic waves almost travel at supersonic speeds, guys. I mean, they travel, what, like 20 miles in like five, six seconds or something like that. They travel very fast. Here's another emergent event, but it's very, very tiny. But yeah, so I already showed on the seismic program swarm how all of these are possible. Now, here is an example of a real seismic event. Check this out. Now this looks like probably some type of regional or teleseism earthquake. Notice how, even though it's very far away, it did show basically at the same times on these stations. Surface events are possible. And if you didn't see my proof in the seismic program swarm just a few minutes ago, just go to the parts section below and click the section about the surface events on the seismic program swarm. And you will see that a surface event again that's stronger than a negative magnitude earthquake didn't appear on surrounding stations. But then how did the negative magnitude appear on surrounding stations then? It was pretty shallow, and it was extremely, extremely, extremely weak. So, guys, again, this doesn't matter much because we already understand how seismic waves propagate away from their source, but it is good to learn this stuff. If you have any questions about this, please let me know and just take away from this. Remember, boreholes minimize surface events greatly, but they do not 100% diminish them all the way. It is still a possibility, as you can prove yourself. Don't take my word for it again. Prove it yourself by using daily events on Borehole 944, such as in January or December of last year or even November. Or even, there's been examples for years and years and years of surface events on Borehole 944. So it still is possible. And again, you can prove that for yourself. It's very easy. Overall, whether I am wrong or right, it doesn't really matter since we are already armed with the knowledge of how seismic waves travel through the Earth. However, strange things do happen at Yellowstone from time to time. Remember that video I did a while back about that fast traveling surface vibration? Well, it showed on YNR, right? Well, Borehole 950 is right where YNR is, and Borehole 950 didn't detect a thing. So that does prove that surface noise is minimized greatly on boreholes. However, as any seismologist would tell you, it does not eliminate surface events 100%. Remember, there are a multitude of factors that could allow any surface event to appear on a borehole station. The strength of the surface event, the source of the surface event, the proximity of the source to the borehole location, and the depth of the borehole itself. Vibrations, depending on their strength, can penetrate hundreds and hundreds of feet of rock and dirt. However, even the tiniest of seismic events that sometimes carry less energy than a strong surface event can travel extremely fast and penetrate miles upon miles of dirt and rock. Let's say harmonic tremor was occurring because of the free flow of magma at depth. Let's also say the free flow of magma is occurring at a very shallow depth of one kilometer, which is still extremely shallow. An event like that would still show on many surrounding stations. However, how would that magma have gotten there without deeper harmonic tremor and earthquake swarms indicating the magma was beginning its journey towards the surface? It cannot just appear out of nowhere, guys. Above all, just remember how events transpire when occurring underground. Imagine underground as a pond, and you throw a rock in the pond and you watch it ripple away in all directions. Since a lot of energy is dispersed when hitting the surface, the deeper and deeper you throw the rock, the farther the ripples will travel. The magma chamber roof is about... 3 miles, 5 kilometers deep or so. That's just the magma chamber roof. The actual mantle plume goes down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, possibly, possibly to the bottom parts of our mantle outer core boundary. Yeah, it's very, 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 very deep. The closest part of the magma chamber roof to the surface is about 3 miles, 5 kilometers deep or so. So really, even the tiniest events signaling magma is traveling from the top of the chamber to the surface would still propagate away from the source like a ripple in a pond, traveling to many stations. Plus, the best thing to do to understand this is take a very centralized location that sees a lot of seismicity. Compare exact same magnitudes like I did in this video, but compare ones that occur near the surface that occur twice as deep, and that occur four times as deep. 
Personal analysis of these events is key to understanding what is going on. Do not take my word for it again, guys. Take your own word for it. The main thing I always watch out for is a moderate to major earthquake swarm occurring near 4 to 6 kilometers deep, possibly even deeper, which does happen more than you think. Just check out the rapid fire swarms that occur in and around West Thumb Lake and Yellowstone Lake. Although the magnitudes are not large all the time, there are some larger magnitudes that do appear on many different stations. For example, the recent magnitude 3.1 in Yellowstone was detected on seismic stations up in Montana and many other surrounding states. It struck around 8.2 kilometers in depth and was a magnitude 3.1, so that helped it travel much farther than if it were to occur near the surface. Regardless of this, the accurate and responsible monitoring of volcanic hazard areas is my passion, and I will always be dedicated to it and the truth. But really, if I see a truth, I'm going to stand up for it, regardless of how people may feel or get mad at me, guys. After all, I am not in this for the money or for the fame. You can see that by my work. Of course, that stuff would be cool a little bit, but that is not my goal. Many YouTubers out there that talk about Yellowstone say they care about Yellowstone monitoring. They love it. They, they want to keep an eye on it. They, you know, they don't have much in their description boxes except for donation links and stuff like that. And they really don't seem committed to it. Many people even have AdSense on their channel, meaning each view gives them money. Now, the AdSense thing is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. It's actually good sometimes. And someday I may do the AdSense thing if it's worth it, but I'm not in this for money, and I'm in this to teach others how to do what I do, so you could prove what I was saying in this video yourself. Finding and accessing seismic data and programs to analyze it is so easy you would be surprised. Now, intricate understandings and analysis is a little harder. After all, we are all learning, which is a good thing. My next in-depth video will be on how to read seismogram, spectrogram, and spectra plots for the section on my website. And after that, I will upload the how to find GPS data video, showing you how to analyze it and how to create your own custom GPS charts. I am still getting that ready, and it will not be out for a couple more days, since I don't want to put that uh, GPS video out until I fully understand how to do it. So let me know what you think of this video and any criticism is welcomed. Just remember to not be rude. <laughs> God bless and be safe, guys. I will always stand for the truth. Why? Because the truth and those who hold the truth are considered hater fear to those who hate or fear that specific truth, especially the people who hate the truth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See you later, guys.